And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 2.30. Stay tuned next for Education Today. From the studios of KPFA in Berkeley, this is Education Today. I'm your host, Kitty Kelly Epstein. We often take calls from you to hear your views on educational issues. We've discovered that we're one of the few programs, at least in the Bay Area, that deals extensively with educational issues. We've talked about everything from No Child Left Behind to the shortage of teachers in urban schools to programs that are doing a good job with uh, in urban schools and programs that young people like, both uh, in school and out of school programs. Uh, we've talked with teachers, young people, college students, and all sorts of folks on this program. Uh, and we will be taking calls from you today. Our phone number is 510-848-4425. Uh, we're first going to be talking with a guest, but then in a few minutes you'll have a chance to call in and comment on what the guest is discussing and perhaps on some other topics also. So again, the telephone number is 510-848-4425. Our guest today, who we'll be talking with by telephone, uh, is one of the creators of an amazing organization that works on three issues simultaneously. The needs of youth, issues of global power, and media and the arts. This organization was founded by two young people themselves uh, as they were exiting college, and uh, it now operates, I believe, in both San Francisco and New York. They put on some celebrations of the youth-oriented media and art that they create, and uh, the, the um, notice for one of those celebrations says it, quote, creatively explores the theme of power in a global society, and that particular celebration is taking place at Zayum in San Francisco in January. Uh, many of you may be familiar with that facility. It's uh, downtown near the Moscone Center uh, in San Francisco, and you all might want to go and visit after you get a chance to hear from one of the co-founders, whose name is Dana Curran, and I'd like to welcome you to Education Today. Thank you so much. It's great to be on. Oh, good. Very nice to hear from you. Yeah. So um, I'd like to hear, and could you tell us the name of your co-founder? She's not going to be with us today, but we'd like yeah. to give her some honor anyway. Sure. Madiha Murshad. She actually is teaching. Um, she's She runs the largest school in Dhaka, Bangladesh, so that is where she is today. Oh, I see. And is she often in the U.S.? Um, she comes twice a year. She's on our board. She joined the board of directors when I she see. went back to Bangladesh. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Um, so can you tell us uh, what the problem is that you were addressing as you created your organization? Sure. Um, well, World Savvy's mission is to educate and engage youth in community and world affairs. And we created the organization um, with t- two primary objectives, to provide teacher training and programming that allowed youth to become more educated and engaged in those issues because we felt as though public public education in the United States wasn't uh, preparing young people to become responsible global citizens. So the reality, I think it's it's been sort of well documented that American students in particular, um, the 18 to 25-year-old set, but, but younger than that as well, know very little about the world beyond our borders. Um, so in addition to content knowledge, things like historical context for things like conflict and ge- knowledge of geography, there are also skills for global citizenship and values and attitudes that um, we, a lot of American students don't have exposure to. So, and that's, I think that's due to a lot of factors. But when Mandiha and I founded World Savvy six years ago, um, her experience was much different from my own. I went to public schools actually on the East Coast in New Jersey. Um, K-12, and her, she attended an international baccalaureate program in Singapore and was educated sort of throughout the Mideast and Asia. Um, and the global consciousness that she developed and sort of all of her peers developed, irrespective of what careers they entered, was really different from um, my, experiencing, my experience growing up. Um, there was very little reference to um, global issues as we know them now, so human rights, poverty and development, security and peace, the environment, 
Um, and we felt pretty strongly that unless those those issues were mainstreamed into public education, that um, we wouldn't be producing graduates who are sort of culturally competent and have the global literacy skills necessary to function effectively in society. So I'm wondering how this works, because I've had some experience myself in trying to um, integrate more of a global perspective or a variety of kinds of curriculum mm-hmm. uh, into uh, secondary schools. And often, I, I, I'm not saying uh, we we didn't produce a lot in a certain respect, but I certainly did run into the problem of all sorts of different mandates that made everybody say, yeah, that's a great idea, but uh, we have this textbook we have to teach, now we're sure. onto the standardized tests, we don't have the money, or just the communication problem of letting teachers know that such a, a thing was possible. So how how are you finding that uh, experience? Are you, ha- are you finding those problems? Are you able to get around them? Um, well, of course, and I think that sort of because education in the U.S. has been like that for so long, it's natural to assume what I think the biggest problem in the past with global education is that it's been just that. It's been sort of relegated as a separate endeavor. And teachers, um, educators more broadly, see it as something additional to take on or schools approach it as something additional to take on. And and some people refer to that as a food flag festival model of looking at um, (laughs) global issues. And and I I think that that's, that's a really sort of dangerous way to look at it because it does, in some instances it exoticizes cultures in, in a way that's negative. It potentially sort of um, further marginalizes issues or, or reinforces what in, in some instances is a real lack of content knowledge that can be mainstreamed. So I'll give you an example. We have three core programs and we designed them with specific um, knowledge and reference to the, the barriers that you just um, you just referenced. So our global educators program, the core model there is a consulting program for individual teachers. Um, it is, it, it, we work with teachers across subject areas. So we have science and math teachers and social studies teachers because we feel that global issues really can be mainstreamed and that that really is the key to doing that. Um, so for instance, we could work with an algebra teacher who's, you know, looking to teach the exponential growth curve by using population statistics and then have a subsequent discussion about population and migration and look at everything from China to San Francisco, my, migration in San Francisco and what, po- how populations move and where and why. Um, so there's, there's lots of different ways to integrate global issues across subject areas and to do it in a way that is still meet standard. I mean, I, I think that um, No Child Left Behind and, and a very test-driven climate in education has has narrowed the way that we look at what we can put in the classroom, but the reality is that these are skills that young people really will need to succeed once they graduate. Um, the issues that we care about, that we're voting about, that are on sort of the political agenda are, you know, everything from immigration to conflict to terrorism and security to the economy, they are all global, and those things can be mainstreamed into subject areas. So the Global Educators Program was designed with that in mind. The other So let me, let me ask you oh, yeah. a little bit more about that before yeah. you talk about the other two. Yeah. So that... That seems like a really uh, sophisticated approach, and certainly the only way that most teachers will integrate is if it's uh, most most teachers are feeling, you know, fairly compliant uh, with the standards, and so you know would uh, would that that does seem like a good approach. Right. I guess I'm wondering, given that particular approach, is any of the funding from the school district? Is it all from foundations? And uh, then how do you get hold of the uh, teachers that you work with, or does the district support you working with them? Can you tell yep. us a little bit about that? Yep. Um, well, we there, that was a, a couple part question. So the first is that um, right now, World Savvy in 2007 was funded 55 percent by individuals, which was um, a, a big swing for us from the year prior, which was 40 percent. Um, there is there are fees for service in our programs, but they're uh, they're heavily subsidized. So for example. Um, the fee for a teacher to be in the Global Educators Program and the consulting model is $100 per, per year, and there's an average of 35 hours per teacher spent um, in supporting them. So in addition to actually creating a resource map where we can identify entry points that are compliant with standards to address global issues for a teacher, we also then provide them with the resources. So there's some fees for service. Um, we, we do have foundation support. Um, you know, the remaining 40-plus percent um, comes from foundations and from corporate funding. And we have some city funding, but that's actually for the media and arts program. Um, so, you know, it's a pretty even split now. We do not receive money from the district, but 
our relation, and we haven't actually recruited through the district. Um, so we have done school presentations. We've done direct recruiting with teachers. So we have given presentations over the last six years in de- uh, department meetings, for example, in the beginning of school. We post on listservs. We give workshops um, in partnership with the Commonwealth Club and with the World Affairs Council. So teachers who come to them learn about that other service. I and, see. So yeah. that means that you get a pretty uh, broad distribution across. It, it mostly you're in San Francisco. Is that right? Yeah. The Global Educators Program is Bay Area ex- ex- almost exclusively. We we are working with some teachers in Sacramento who sort of found us, and we have one distance partnership with a school in Providence, but that's sort of an, a, a pilot. So let me ask you, um, if you, uh, first of all, I want to give out our telephone number again, and I'm hoping that maybe you could describe the other two programs briefly, and mm-hmm. then we could let our callers come in whenever they wish and uh, uh, maybe ask some questions to you also if you're able to stay with us for the next few minutes. Sure. Um, uh, so our number again is 510-848-4425. This is Education Today, and we're talking with one of the founders of World World Savvy, that's W-O-R-L-D, and then S-A-V-V-Y, if you're interested in looking it up. Um, and they do work on uh, global education, youth, and media. And uh, Dana has been describing their uh, the program that has to do with uh, c- curriculum and coaching for teachers who want to integrate global understanding into their curriculum. And she's about to tell us about a couple other programs. So if you, our listeners, are interested in talking with her or with us about the situation of uh, young people in the United States, how much they do and don't know about the world, uh, you can call into our number, which is 510-848-4425. Okay, you want to tell us about your other programs? Yeah, so I've described one of the three core programs, which is the Global Educators Program, and then there are two programs for youth, um, middle school to high, and high school youth. The first is an academic program and competition called the World Affairs Challenge, and that um, runs, we actually just completed recruiting for that. Um, it's about a six-month-long program where students take an annual global theme. This year it's global health and teams of 7 to 12 students, um, primarily in the after-school realm, but a lot of teachers have integrated it into curriculum. About a third of our teachers do. Um, they examine a subtopic of the broader global theme and prepare a solution-oriented presentation um, that they actually bring to the competition in March, and then they compete in three other events on that day. Um, the objective there is that they're obviously developing research skills around global problems, but they're also working on teamwork and presentation and collaboration on the day of the event they participate in a collaborative a collaborative question which requires problem solving with students from other schools. We reorganize their teams. Can you give us an example of what a collaborative question might be? Sure. So when all this, there are, this year there'll be 500 students at the challenge and 700 participating in the program. So we break them into new teams of students they've not met by middle school and high school division. And the year that we examined contemporary conflict, for example, we gave them a, uh, they were the committee to select a Nobel laureate for the Peace Prize. Um, so they had profiles of six individuals that could receive the Nobel Peace Prize, and they had to select which one would receive it. Of course, the idea is that every single one of those individuals in the portfolio had received the prize in past years for different kinds of work. So one was an educator, one worked on landmines, one worked with GMOs, and the idea is that there isn't a right answer to these collaborative questions, but it introduces the complexities when you're trying to... Um, reduce, simplify something, you know, decide who, cre- who is, who, you know, in the best position to create peace and select from one of those four pretty amazing individuals. That's a, and, that's a terrific uh, approach, H- having worked a lot with high school students right. in a classroom for a number of years. Yeah. You know, you kind of get a sense of what would work, and uh, I, I think that that kind of approach of having someone uh, choose in that way would be great. Have you any uh, I- any likelihood, or, or I- is the, I know a lot of us around here have been very much affected and concerned about the oil spill. Is that a type of issue that you might deal with in uh, in in the realm of global health? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the interesting thing about the World Affairs Challenge, and I would say the very different thing, is that we put no restrictions on what students can come up with in terms of what they want to one of the, what they want to focus on for their presentation, but I feel very confident that that will certainly be something that comes up because so many of these young people are living in communities that were affected by it and they have they are aware of it. So I, I certainly imagine that that's going to come up. And you know, students are starting to make a much more um, 
uh, a tangible connection between environment and conflict, environment and health, and that comes up a lot in all of our programming. So That's terrific. Yeah. Again, our phone number, 510-848-4425. Our listeners are welcome to call in. Uh, we will be taking your calls to talk with me and Dana Curran, who's describing the programs of World Savvy. I wonder, before you um, tell us about the third program, if you do any of your work with uh, educators in the East Bay, are you thinking about doing that, or is San Francisco... All you can handle it. No, we do. We actually work with um, the World Affairs Challenge. We recruit from all over Northern California. So at, at pretty much any interested teacher um, or student, a lot of the students have taken the program from their middle schools to high schools are certainly welcome to uh, participate. The same is true with our Global Educators Program. And we do currently work with some East Bay, East Bay schools. Where we work with teachers in Berkeley High School. We're in Richmond High School. Um, we work with, obviously, quite a number of schools in San Francisco. But def- most definitely the East Bay is... Um, is part of our portfolio. Great. And uh, what is your th- what is the third program? The third program is called the Global Youth Media and Arts Program, and essentially that is an arts education, arts and media education program um, that was meant to use students' own lives and perspectives as a platform to examine these broader global issues, and then to create art and media based on their exploration of a global theme. So we've done in the past peace and conflict, local to global. Last year we did immigration and identity, and this year in San Francisco, students looked at power in a global society. So the way that the program worked is um, we partner with up to 25 community-based organizations and some classroom teachers now um, who have some skill in art and media. So, you know, we've worked with Baycat and Bayvac and Zako Dance and Destiny Arts and over the years a range of um, community-based organizations that are working with youth ages 12 to 18. And essentially, we provide some professional development around the global theme with their educators, and then we work directly with the youth, providing workshops and field trips that are pertinent to that global theme. And during the course of the fall, youth are creating work, um, art and media, that is then displayed at a museum for two months in December and January. So that work is up now at Zium, which is in Yerba Buena. And the visual exhibition opened last Friday, but that work is hanging um, for two months. And then the performances, so the performance artists that were in that program, are going to be performing on the weekend of January 18th and 19th. And so people can certainly purchase tickets to see that. Um, But the real unique thing about that program program is it obviously isn't an academic program, but it was created to acknowledge that there are very many entry points to thinking about, thinking creatively about these seemingly intractable problems um, and getting youth who, you know, sometimes wouldn't maybe self-select to be involved in a program like the World Affairs Challenge, um, and but live in this in- incredibly media-saturated culture to use some of the skills they're acquiring um, and develop a voice about these issues of consequence. And, and it's it's been pretty fascinating what's come out of it. And our partnerships we selected um, the, the partners in the program are extremely diverse. So we do we work with Larkin Street Youth um, and Baycat and a cl- journalism class from Burton High School. And so, in addition to doing all this work kind of independently and through partnerships with World Savvy, all the youth come together at a jam session um, this year. That was at SoMarts, and they work with professional artists for a day to create work around that theme. So let me give out your the information again if people are interested either in. Um, Going to see the uh, art exhibits, which are actually already up, yep. and they are at Zayum, which is 221 4th Street in San Francisco. That's at 4th and Howard. And uh, the telephone number for World Savvy is 415-292-7421 if you wanted to talk with them directly. Uh, we're talking with Dana Curran. If we have teachers out there or students or parents or anybody else who's interested in the subject of global uh, awareness and how it can be approached better in the schools. If you have concerns in your own educational institution about uh, young people's knowledge or lack of it about uh, world issues, we'd love to hear from you. Please do call in. And our telephone number at KPFA on Education Today is 510-848-4425. And we're talking about uh, global awareness and what happens in schools and whether young people are getting a sufficient knowledge of uh, of global issues as they impact them. I know uh, Dana talked about the difference in, in U.S. awareness and, and uh, other countries around these issues, and I'm always surprised when I travel to other countries um, that people who have much less access to newspaper and media and radios and, you know, just um, uh, much less... Um, 
wealthy environment know so much more. I've, you know, been in Latin America and had people tell me all very knowledgeably about the details of uh, our Governor Schwarzenegger and his uh, history and his points of view. Uh, I talked to one woman in Europe and said, you know, um, I was described someone who was teaching a world history class and, you know, this woman waiting for a bus somewhere in Europe said, well, how long does that class last? I said, you know, a year. And she said, oh, wow, in America, you spend a whole year on the history of the world, huh? That's really profound. So, you know, that type of um, the, the the sort of recognition that in the U.S. we're not very aware and yet have such an incredible, enormous impact on people in other countries. Right. So, um we're really happy about the work that you do, and we have a caller with us now, Brian from Sunnyvale. Welcome to KPFA. Oh, thank you, and thank you for the show. Sure. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Ms. Kern for her efforts in the, the first program, the Global Education uh, Education Program, because uh, I think it gets at uh, one of the issues I and a lot of my friends uh, had with our education when we were in high school. I graduated in 99, and we all asked, the same questions of, you know, what does this have to, what are the things we are learning have to do with our lives after we get out of school? And putting them in the context of, like algebra, you were talking about the, um, the population numbers and things like that. Putting it in context like that, that we can understand and connect with other people, I think is really great. So, you know, just thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you, you for your comment. Thanks. Um, we have with us Jim from Mill Valley. Hi. Hi, Jim. How are you doing? Good. I uh, wanted to let you know that one of the uh, first classes in San Francisco on ecology I taught at the junior high school level, and one of our emphasis was doing local things, uh, planting trees, cleaning uh, like uh, Mountain Lake, which is in the Presidio, uh, cleaning up the uh, bottles and drudge and stuff like that, and I think starting on a local level so they can see that it's happening there and giving remedies that can be done. Good point. What do you yeah. think of that, Dana? Oh, I could not agree more. And I, and without sort of the sufficient time to address it, one of the, the bigger points is in, you're right in order to make people feel empowered to take individual action is so important. So once you demonstrate that there's a connection between individual action and a global outcome, what can they actually do in the day-to-day -day to impact change? Because those things can feel very overwhelming, absolutely. But second, secondary to that, and but equally important, is that it, it, it is otherwise not relevant to students' lives. And, and you know, I, I would be... I would be lying if I said you could march into any middle school classroom and start talking about Sudan and the humanitarian crisis there and and get every child in the room to care and be responsive and make a connection to their own lives. So I absolutely agree with that. And so in, in each of these programs, um, and particularly in the media and arts program that's happening now, the idea really was to start very locally with their own lives. So by way of example, when we did immigration and identity, one of the field trips was taking a group of youth with professional artists to the Little Saigon community. And at the time, the Chronicle had published an article about the disputed borders of that community. So this group of students, some of whom were Vietnamese, um, walked through that neighborhood trailing a long stick of chalk. And they had to decide where they thought the borders began and ended by looking at the businesses, by looking, talking to the residents, mm -hmm. by and so that that sort of conversation tied up after the field trip was through with a discussion about the fluidity and the subjectivity of borders, whether that's in your neighborhood, whether that's in your state, whether that's nationally or internationally. So contextualizing it and beginning locally is of vital importance, not just to make sort of people feel empowered about what they can do, um, but to create some relevance so that y you aren't, you know, I mean, the, the comment of the previous caller to say, what does this have to do with our lives outside the classroom is, is an apt one. And so I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I commend you on your efforts as well with the ecology class. Thank you for your call, Jim. And I, I want to commend you, Dana, for the examples you've given of the approaches you use with young people. I, f I feel confident work. And uh, because of that, I'm wondering, do you actually, I'm, here I am giving out your contact information. Uh, do you have a staff large enough to uh, <laughs> to manage the uh, more people than you've already got working with you? Yeah, well, right now we're, we're a staff of six, actually, in San Francisco. I'm in New York now, actually, overseeing the launch of the program here. And I we see. are expanding um, to the Midwest 
to the Twin Cities in summer of 2008. Right. Um, so we... we <laughs> The short answer to that question is we've experienced a a lot of growth in the last 18 months, and 2008 will not be an exception. So there's so much work to be done in this area that our staff will certainly be growing. Um, Terrific. Yes. We have another caller, uh, Craig from San Leandro. Uh, Thank you for taking my call. You know, I think the Bay Area is so rich in terms of its uh, uh, diversity that it sort of lends itself to a, a a more sort of global perspective on things. But, you know, as a country of the United States, it's so nationalistic that it's very hard for us to look at other countries and uh, see how they can do things if they do things uh, better than we do, like on health care or other issues. And uh, uh, I think one of the real obstacles we have as a country is overcoming our, our nationalism, and it's really bred into people. And yeah, that's my comment. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and we have a uh, last caller, I think, uh, Sarah from Oakland. Welcome to KPFA. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm giving a call because I was really excited to hear about the different projects uh, that these kids are doing, you know, trailing the chalk through the neighborhood that's brilliant, um, as well as some of the other things. And what I was wondering is, is there good kind of media follow-up? Because without... I don't want to sound facetious, but I think a lot of politicians genuinely could learn a lot from the solutions that these kids come up with. And I think it would be really exciting to kind of hear more of that on a level where it can be recognized and maybe even implemented. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much, Sarah. And I, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, by the end of... By March of 2008, we'll have our 2,000th student participate in the challenge, which is just one of the programs, and they, they are there exclusively to present solutions to global problems. Sadly, our media coverage, um, I would, I like to refer to World Savvy as the best kept secret, and, the, and that's not intentional, but, um, but we, it, that, no, I would not say that all that, that can be done, um, in terms of, um, getting more awareness on the work that the teachers and the students are doing. Um, there's more work to be done there. So, But you're right. I mean, they cer- certainly they could benefit from hearing what some of these students have to say. Hopefully our listeners today will uh, spread the word. Uh, it sounds like you do have a lot of work already on your plate, but it's, it's, uh, it's important work and uh, having a creative idea about what will appeal to young people at the same time, kind of a principled uh, view of what, kind of information they need is is just tremendously valuable and i really uh, respect the work you all are doing thank you thank you for being with us today thank you so much for having me sure and i'm i'm sure you'll be getting some visitors well excellent thank you very much sure um I wanted to uh, tell our listeners that we will be having a program on December 28th, and that is a day that more people are out of school. I know people bemoan sometimes that this program takes place when a lot of them are in the classroom, but December 28th you won't be, so I hope you'll be with us and calling in, and we'll probably have a pretty open format for people evaluating the year uh, of where we've been in education, where are we going, what do we need to do. Uh, the producer for education today, the producers are Kevin Cartwright and Jaron Epstein. Um, The board op for today's program is Erica Bridgman, and I'm your host, Kitty Kelly Epstein. Hope to be talking with you on December 28th at 2.30. Thank you. Bye-bye.